The long preparations of chaos have come to their final phase. The stage was set. Seeds of chaos landed on fertile soil surrounding Horus Lupercal. The heavy burden of leadership, combined with a few blunders, had taken its toll on Horus. Erebus, the man who had already corrupted a Primarch, was attempting to do it one more time. But there was no time or room for error. Will he be able to accomplish such a daunting task? Welcome to our series on Warhammer 40k and the Horus Heresy, explaining the origins of the Imperium and Chaos. This third video will explore Horus's failed campaigns and Erebus's plot. There's a lot of detail in the Warhammer 40k universe, and if you want to make your own universe with anything like this level of fidelity, we recommend using the world building tools from our sponsor World Anvil. This is a program that manages a creative world, its history, people, creatures, places, factions and relationships, all interlinked in a single easy to use database that functions like a wiki for your world, making writing new content that's cohesive and immersive simple. Once you have your world fleshed out, use World Anvil to help you adventure there. You can update the state of the lore through World Anvil to track the progress of a Dungeons & Dragons campaign or loads of other tabletop rule sets too. Alternatively, use the resources as a database for writing a novel. You can do the writing inside World Anvil to link everything up with the lore and design materials. This makes collaborating extra easy, as other writers can see what the official canon currently is at any time and work together with a coherent central picture. This also makes it easier to show off to other people, since everything they need will be right there for them to browse. You can check out World Anvil via our link in the description. If you use our code WIZARDS, they'll give you 40% off all recurring memberships, so support our channel and your imagination by taking a look. While the campaign on 6319 was reaching its end, Horus's fleet received a distress signal from the planet 14020. From there, a small fleet of Blood Angels were sending a series of SOS messages that, over time, were becoming gradually incoherent, until the last signal consisted only of one sentence. This planet is murder. The Warmaster sent full force to this seemingly cursed planet to investigate. Yet Horus wasn't the only one who decided to answer this call for help. Many other fleets from across different legions set out to this star system. The first ones to arrive were the Emperor's children, under the command of the Lord Commander Eidolon. When he arrived, the situation was looking grim. Planet 14020, now nicknamed Murder, was covered in a severe storm that blocked almost all communication and didn't allow anything to land except drop pods, and prevented the deployment of anything other than infantry. Lord Commander Eidolon, after hearing that Horus's fleet was only days away from arriving, decided to send all of his space marines to the surface, repeating the blunder of the Blood Angels. Scattered in the atmosphere, small groups of the Astartes landed in a thick, foggy forest of trees similar to bamboo. Disoriented and lost, they were ambushed by the local species, the Megarachnids. These insects were extremely fast, and their armoured carapace could withstand bolter fire. Every skirmish with these spiders, each lasting only a few seconds, ended with some space marine casualties. The largest surviving group was under the command of Captain Saul Tarvitz, a stalwart and principled commander, and Captain Lucius, an extraordinary fencer. Eventually, they uncovered the fate of the Blood Angels, whose bodies were impaled on giant white trees. Saul Tarvitz decided that letting the Space Marines rot up there would be a grim indignity, and thus used all of the company's explosives to destroy those trees. However, this act of honor had unforeseen consequences. These trees were producing the storms in the atmosphere. With it gone, the newly arrived lunar wolves dropped to the surface to save their fellow Astartes. Over the next six months, several fleets arrived, most notably the Blood Angel fleet under the command of the Primarch Sanguinus and Wordbearer's fleet under the command of the First Chaplain Erebus. During this bloody and lengthy campaign, the Megarachnids continued to show up in force, this time with more powerful and larger subspecies, the scariest ones capable of cutting deep into Titan's armor. Throughout the brutality, one mystery remained. In orbit of murder, a Zeno satellite was constantly sending indecipherable melodic messages. Until one day, three enormous spaceships, larger than any Imperial vessel, exited the warp. 
As it turned out, they were Interrex, a human race that achieved harmony with alien species. Several years ago, they defeated the Megarachnids and took away their space-traveling technology. They were the ones who left this enigmatic message, a warning not to enter this planet. The Interrex differed a lot from the Imperium in that they were much more peaceful. They sought collaboration with other civilizations, even Xenos, and their technology was more advanced. While most of the Imperials were eager to destroy this civilization, Horus wanted to integrate them into the Imperium. Because of the recent events on 6319, where human civilization was destroyed. Not wanting for that to happen again, he tried his best to persuade the Interrex into joining the Empire. The two factions sat down for negotiations on the planet of Zenobia, but soon the talks were becoming unreasonably lengthy. Interrex, for some reason, were very cautious around the Imperials. During the key talks in the residence of the planet Gubernator, it was revealed that Interrex were afraid that the Imperium was serving chaos. Unfortunately, this revelation came too late. Erebus, unknowingly to everyone, had stolen Anathema, the Chaos Sword, from the Museum of Warfare. The Imperium was branded as a force of chaos, and war broke out. After destroying Interrex forces on Zenobia, Horus deemed that they were no longer any threat, and left them to exist in their corner of the galaxy until some other Imperial fleet would arrive there in an undisclosed future. After spending almost a year in the field, the War Master was overwhelmed with the amount of requests for his help. It seemed like his brothers were trying to challenge his authority by proving that he was unworthy of such a title, while officials bombarded him with administrative requests, mostly regarding taxation. Horus could not understand why taxes had to be collected so soon, as it would certainly spark rebellions. However, one of these requests sounded reasonable. Erebus, who helped him in recent campaigns, wanted help for a week-long campaign on the Davin system. On the way, Horus became increasingly gloomy. The failure to bring two human civilizations to the Imperium, the pointless war on the planet murder, and the ongoing and never-ending political struggle took a toll on his mental health. Consequently, he distanced himself from the Monival in favor of Erebus. On arrival at Davin, it was revealed that this Imperial world had rebelled against the authority of the Empire. This was the first time such a thing had happened, but due to the charismatic persuasion of Erebus, Horus himself led his forces onto the planet's moon where the traitors resided. The force consisted of 1,000 Space Marines and three Titans, with the rear being protected by Imperial Guardsmen. En route to the moon, a message was heard on the Vox radio. The same voice that was heard on 6319 spoke ominous messages. This time, Samus spoke to Neil before Nergleth, yet before it could devastate morale, it was isolated on an unused radio frequency and its place of origin was tracked, a feat which had not been possible last time. Subsequently, the army landed close to the signal center. The surface, which 60 years ago was a cold desert, was now a rotting swamp emitting gas which created a thick, toxic fog. During the advance, the force started to break formation due to low visibility. Suddenly, rotting corpses rose from the murky water. Chaos ensued. The depth of the swamp began drowning men. All cohesion was lost. The Titans couldn't do anything until one of them spotted an unidentified flying vessel and decided to shoot it down. This was friendly fire, as the ship belonged to civilians who wanted to see the battle, but the burning wreck served as a lighthouse amidst the treacherous swampy fog. Now rallied, the Astartes reached the command post of the enemy without much resistance. On the surface lay a crashed Imperial ship, left on Davin as part of a garrison. Titans bombarded the hull, creating entrances for the Space Marines. The forces were split to enter the ship from four sides, while two companies guarded the entrance. Horus rushed directly to the bridge. On the way, the damaged ship started to collapse and flipped on its side. At this moment, the corpses renewed their offensive, this time bolstered by horned demons. The situation was grim. Inside, scattered forces couldn't establish communications, while on the outside, the soldiers ran out of bullets. The battle was decided on the bridge. There, Horus dueled and killed the traitor, Eugen Temba, but not before being wounded. In the moment of the traitor's death, 
all rotten forces lost their lives instantly. While regrouping in front of the destroyed ship, Horus collapsed, his seemingly small shoulder wound insistently bleeding, with any attempt to patch it not working. Horus was transported on his flagship, where hundreds of civilians were waiting for his triumphant return. Instead, they were met with a stampede of Astartes, who didn't even slow down as they created a path for the unconscious Warmaster. Even with the full might of Imperial healing, the only thing achieved was the buying of time. Gavia Lokan, with Tarek Togadan, went to the surface to recover the blade that wounded Horus. They discovered that it was the blade that was stolen from the Interrex, and that the only person it could belong to was Erebus. Terrified by their discovery, they rushed back to the ship, only to discover that Horus was not there. While they were absent, Erebus, founder of the Lunar Wolves Warrior Lodge, called an emergency meeting. He convinced the remaining two members of the Monival to send Horus to the Temple of the Serpent on Davin's surface, where ritual healing could bring even the dead to life. In the next nine days, the fate of the Warmaster would be known. Behind the closed doors, Horus was being given visions from chaos. Yet he had a defender, Magnus the Red, who was confident that he would be able to defeat Chaos' influence. In his dream, Horus saw a beautiful world full of nature that was being transformed into industrial hell. Lost wolves started chasing him, reminding him of his identity as the Lunar Wolves' Primarch. He was then guided by Sejanus, his dead advisor, who in fact was Erebus in disguise. Horus was shown visions of the future, where the Emperor was a god of mankind, where entire worlds existed for the single goal of worshipping the Emperor, where beside the Emperor only nine Primarchs stood, and Horus was not among them. He was then shown a vision of the past. On Terra, deep inside the Emperor's laboratory, he saw the moment of the scattering of the Primarchs. Yet in the vision, the Emperor caught the infants prior to their abduction and then decided to let them go, dooming them to a hellish life. After this vision, Magnus caught up. Using sorcery, he dispelled the illusion of Erebus and begged Horus not to let the temptations reach his heart. Horus was torn. By using sorcery, Magnus had broken the Edict of Nicaea, but Erebus was no better, duplicitously hiding himself behind the illusion. Neither man's advice could be trusted. Ultimately, Horus decided to stand against the Emperor, to lead a rebellion against the changes that were happening in the Imperium. Magnus, now knowing that Horus was truly lost, could not allow his rebellion to grow. He decided that the Emperor must be warned. For him, this information couldn't wait, so he prepared the strongest warp message he could create, sending a projection of his mind alongside it to break all obstacles Chaos would surely throw on his way to terror. The signal was so strong that the Chaos Gods decided to remove all obstacles in its way. With full force it reached terror breaching the defences that the Emperor had set up. It tore a hole in a fragile construction of the secret project of the Emperor. Demons could now freely enter Terra directly from the warp, without need of possession or summoning rituals. Thousands of them invaded Terra through this hole. Millions died before Terra was cleansed. The Emperor had to sit on the Golden Throne, a contraption that allowed him to control his project to close the gap. If he rose from the throne, the hall would open again. Thus the Overlord of Humanity became chained to his seat, not allowing him to participate in the upcoming conflict. The Emperor was enraged at Magnus, who destroyed key infrastructure, let in demons on terror, and disregarded his pledge to never use powers of the warp again. The Legion of Space Wolves, under the command of the Primarch Lehman Rus, was dispatched to punish Magnus. Realizing what he had done, Magnus decided to passively await the coming punishment from the Emperor. In the end, warnings that he had completely disregarded were true. He ordered his fleet to disperse and leave his homeworld Prospero. When his legion was on the planet, he cut his planet from all communications with the outside, including methods that used sorcery. While on the way to punish Magnus, Lehman Rus received help from Horus, who gave him 5,000 Astartes and a message saying that Magnus wouldn't surrender. This convinced the Space Wolves to prepare for the assault. On arrival, Lehman Rus decided to give one last chance to the Thousand Sons. He sent a messenger to treat with his foes, 
yet the person he chose was a Chaos agent and did not deliver the message. After receiving no response, orbital bombardment started. This resulted in genocide, for the population of the world was slaughtered, along with most of the Legion. Only one key city remained, the capital Tizka, that was shielded by sorcerers. Despite it all, Magnus was still ordering his soldiers to stand down and accept the punishment, but his forces didn't want to die. 10,000 Thousand Sons, hundreds of whom were Psykers and three Titans, prepared to make a final stand. The landing force, led directly by Lehman Rus, consisted of 73,000 Space Wolves, 5,000 Sons of Horus, 40,000 Imperial Guardsmen and 12 Titans. They were supported by 3,000 Sisters of Silence, the anti-psychic warriors, and 1,000 Adeptus Custodes, personal guards of the Emperor. As soon as they landed, the massacre started. Civilians were shot on sight, buildings were burned. Seeing this brutality, the civilians started forming a militia. Despite their numbers reaching hundreds of thousands, their military value against attacking space marines was marginal. The defenders started digging themselves into destroyed buildings, upon seeing that the custodians instantly attacked to prevent a drawn-out city battle. Despite their incredible martial prowess, they were vulnerable to psychic attacks. Suffering losses, they maintained pressure until the Sisters of Silence arrived, disabling sorcery, forcing the Thousand Sons to retreat. The first line of defense was broken, yet an ace from the sleeve was pulled. The Titans, shielded by a team of Psykers, could freely attack without any damage being dealt in return. Space Wolves that were too eager to chase retreating forces were struck by both Psychic Attacks and Titan Fire. The defenders were losing too much ground in their retreat, but if they could hold out for a little longer, Magnus would join the battle and maybe even save them. To that end, the wedge formation under Lehman Rus had to be stopped. Daring attacks were made, and powerful spells were slung, but Primarchs were resistant to these sorts of attacks. In the end, the counter-offensive was crushed. To make matters worse, overusing powers of the warp, already weakened by the presence of the Sisters of Silence, brought Chaos powers into the Thousand Sun's sorcery. Soon, psychic augmented machines started malfunctioning, the most devastating being the explosions of the Titans. With the Titans destroyed, all remaining forces retreated to the pyramid where Magnus resided, and all civilians were evacuated. Finally, in the last moment of battle, Magnus joined the fight. His powerful sorcery killed hundreds, until Lehman Rus arrived. Even resistant to sorcery, he felt the impact of Magnus's attacks. After a fierce duel, Lehman broke Magnus's spine. Dying on the floor, Magnus heard the call from the warp. The voices of Chaos promised that he and the remainder of his legion would survive if only he would pledge his servitude to the Chaos God Sinch. Magnus agreed, saving just over a thousand space marines, mostly sorcerers. This event, known as the Burning of Prospero, was one of the greatest misunderstandings in the history of the Imperium. An entire planet was executed, and 60,000 thousand sons died with the rest joining Chaos. All of it started with Horus's fall to Chaos. Misunderstandings and the machinations of Chaos had already corrupted three Primarchs. How many more would fall? Find out in our next episode. Our series on the Warhammer 40k Horus heresy will continue, so make sure you are subscribed and have pressed the bell button to see it. Please consider liking, commenting and sharing, it helps immensely. Our videos would be impossible without our kind patrons and YouTube channel members, whose ranks you can join via the links in the description to know our schedule, get early access to our videos, access our Discord, and much more. This is the Wizards and Warriors channel, and we will catch you on the next one.